Okay, we can start. So welcome back, everyone. First question: How was the homework? Was it too hard? No one, no one is, no one dares to say too hard. Was it hard? It was a case, right? Uh, challenging. So what was challenging? Pipes. Pipes are a little challenging, especially if you want to support recursive pipes, right? I mean, for me, again, uh, since I don't, unfortunately, program that much, when I was helping someone in uh, during my office hours, of course, C was that's like a double star pointer to an array of strings. Uh, a little, yeah, weird. So that's challenging. I agree. So uh, what I did for that person who came to me, I actually told them how to debug this, right? So I like in that homework, there was a part about GDB. I still encourage you to, if even, even if you manage to complete your homework without using the GDB or any other debugger, I would I would say try it. I mean, it's it's kind of still a soft landing. So in that like that piece of code which you were writing, GDB was still a tool which you kind of kind of master. And uh, when we start doing stuff like in our next homework and the homework after that, so and the next homework will be assigned probably today, and it will ask you to load an ELF file into memory of the program and execute a function inside that ELF. Again, we'll keep it simple, so it's it will be nothing like like really, really hard, but still GDB dumping memory, what is that you loaded? Where, where is it you jumping? So most likely, unless you're lucky in this next homework and it just works at the level of C, it happens. So I've seen it. You will have to say, look, I really want to look at the assembly. I stepping instruction. When I do this call, where is it I'm jumping? If I jump to zero, I might jump to some random address. There might be no even instructions. The page might be not mapped, right? So that's that's the power of those tools and uh i'll send a link so there is a class at mit the uh, which uh which is called something like a lost semester of computer science degree uh it's essentially a class which teaches how to use those tools gdb make files build systems uh what else like git uh continuous integration stuff like that so all of it right so I mean, it's again looks very, very easy. We kind of know this stuff, like. But every time I, I have to do something, you know, I have a, my own little tiny file where I keep my frequently used commands. So yeah, I recommend watching over it if you if you are not an expert or if you are not in shape, and then it will become easier. I'll send the link later. Okay, so plan for today is the following. So we'll quickly finish position independent code. Again, we will never see position-independent code in this class, but still, it's so useful uh, that it makes sense to kind of have a general idea of how it works because all the real programs which you will see on uh, in real life will use this this construction. On Unix, I will, I will on all the Unix systems, I will show a specific example how it works, and this is still how it works today. And on Windows, I assume they use something similar. Okay, so. Do we still remember what this uh, shared libraries are and why we need position independent code? Who can tell me? Just minimizing disk space. Not just disk space, but also space in memory. Yeah. Memory space. So look, so the idea is the following. You compile your uh, uh ba, 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 ba. wanted to show you an example. Uh, shall I or shall I not? Okay, like let's let's do quickly an example just to illustrate the point. Uh, just example of how much space it takes to like to sorry to run a, run something like uh, and again everyone will see my wonderful email but it's small so no one will be able to read right uh, as long as I can sign up. so what I wanted to to show you guys sorry uh is the following thing 
So I'm I'm going to to Cade Machines, uh, and this is because it's the easiest environment for me right now, so not not to deal with macOS. And I say, look, uh, I have this uh, uh, hello int example, which is just uh, man horrible scheme here. Can you even see it? Let me just uh, zoom in a little. So it just adds two numbers in A plus B, right? Uh, do you even can you even see this? Why? That's too dark. Scary. So, but you, you see the example on the screen, right? So, uh, let me actually I just for a sec. Uh, just it's super really annoying. Uh, <clears throat> Let me just copy my WIM setup so we might have a better color scheme. Just a sec. Did it work? Really? Still about the same. So minimal progress in terms of color schemes. Okay, anyway, so very small program, right? Just two numbers. So if I, I told you, you can compile it with something like, uh, uh, let me show you here. With something like this, right? So a command line here says uh, GCC minus uh, flag. Okay, let's just uh, for the sake of it, instead of saying just compile, say compile. Do we care about position dependent code? Doesn't matter in this case. Just thirty two bit program uh, a out. That's what uh, this thing compiles. It executes, of course. It doesn't print anything on the street on the screen, so we can quickly just to make sure that we. Uh, can do something like uh, int c equals a plus b, um, return c. What I'm doing here, I just like add a printf to make sure that we understand that something happens. Yeah. A plus b is, uh, let's say, and well, let's see here. Uh, we to z, blah, 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 blah. Compile again, so run it, or it prints 11. So very, very smart, right? So, and now let's say I use L command, which just shows the sizes of the files. And this is the size of this program, right? So it's uh, seven kilobytes roughly, right? Uh, AL, that's what we compile, right? Uh, it's still a little larger so than I expected. So what if we do something like static? Still 11, let's see. And now it suddenly grew to 733 kilobytes, right? Wow, and I just put a flag static, which means link everything static. We do not use dynamic libraries, right? So, and uh, uh, what I meant to say here, and like if I if I remove the static flag and uh, like compile like this, uh, and I do obj dump, let's say disassemble, let's say, Use Intel syntax a out. Uh, it's a gen piece of file. So, like it added this init function. Hold on, I promised uh, not to touch the position independent code, but this is really position independent code. So, let me just quickly recompile without it. Uh, if this can help us, but maybe not actually. Yeah, man, not. Uh, that I do really need to do to do this. So mini minus G. Uh, minus G for debugging, we probably don't need. Let me take a look at which flag controls really no pick. Used to work with no pick. I have all my examples here. You can actually take a look. Uh, PAE. Just wanted, really wanted to make sure that we mm, we avoid position independent code, but uh, but those uh, the PLT is a program linkage table is part of this. Uh, uh, what do we have? Like if we sort search for main, 
that's our main function, right? So, and this is actually true. It calls this printf, right? So this is exactly what we want. So like we computed everything called the printf, uh, but like there is still like a bunch of stuff. Uh, so I guess uh, the standard libraries and all these things which execute before the program even start get get linked together. So if you really just want to uh, to take a look at just the hello int uh, program, you have to do something like just compile it, don't do anything. And then you probably need to do something like hello int uh, dot o, and then that's it. So right, so that's from my command line to here. It fits on the screen. That's what I use in the lectures. This is the, the example. So just say, okay, just compile, do not link, right? So it literally just compiled the main function. And uh, as you can see, this is exactly, uh, it still maintains the, the frame, right? Interesting on this machine. Uh, reserve space for local variables on the stack here, right? Sorry. Uh, just initializes them with five and six, A and B, right? Then loads them in registers, does the addition exactly like we did in the lecture. Uh, and then like does something to the C variable. Uh, and then this is the call to printf, which is uh, like not known, but by the way, so if you, if you very carefully see, so this is the loop I was talking about, instead of looping back to, uh, looping back to, to the main function, it actually loops back, I think to the same instruction, right? So it will be sitting here. So, but again, so not surprised, but my point here, just first of all, I wanted to show that the the size of those statically and dynamically linked programs, the size which we like, we, we can run uh, varies dramatically, right? So it's 7K versus 700K, so 100 times. Like there's a lot of libraries if you say, do not, uh, do not use uh, dynamic libraries, right? Uh, so that's sad. So do we understand the, do we understand the, the motivation for shared libraries, right? So at a high level, the idea will be the following. So um, by the way, any questions about the example which I showed, although it was a little hectic. Okay, well, cool. a lot of questions. Yeah, go ahead. Right, so let's take a look. If I did a, if I do compile with static, so what we what we want here is a LDD, which says, okay, show us the dependencies. And now I didn't do static. So we look at A out uh, and it says, okay, yeah, I depend on a bunch of things. Like uh, specifically, uh, this is the linker and loader get, which gets loaded into the, into the address space of the program. And we depend on libc here, right? So libc, implements the printf and stuff like that, right? And all the system calls. So, and if I do the static, I would assume it should disappear. But uh, let's take a look and it says, okay, you know, so not a dynamically executable, right? So if you if you really like do obj dump on this one, uh, let me quickly do it. And you say printf, so it will take us some time, so, but, uh, Yes, like those are the familiar functions and uh, which like implements part of printf. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's do it differently. Like again, beauty of this, we can grab for printf uh, and then do a less and uh, try to from like essentially understand uh, where is that printf is, is actually implemented. So instead of like scrolling all the way, we can say, we can scroll it away anyway. There's a lot of cons, uh, calls of printf, uh, but uh, if we search for, what is it we have to search for? Like this, I know. We're just looking for implementation of printf. And uh, I guess this is the one, right? So, which is implemented at this address. And so like what I did again, I like, I like when I was using examples of those pipelines in my lectures, they looked a little goofy, but really this is how, and I'm by far not the best at common line and stuff like that. But this is just a simple example where I say like, I really wanna see where 
printout or F printout has implemented in this file. I started searching, but the search takes me to like million instances, or not million, but maybe thousands of instances. So, and then I say, okay, I'm gonna pipe it through graph and I will narrow down the search to specifically search for this like column, which says, okay, this is the label, right? And so then I can quickly find it and I can go back to that file. And I, I could potentially use the same uh, search expression inside less, but uh, somehow didn't didn't do that, right? So, but if we go back here, and actually, I don't know if it will work because I didn't copy, I did copy. Uh, so this is my implementation of those uh, printf. It goes to ioprint, which is here, which we can say again, uh, control V. Man, really? Uh, let's see this. Uh, control C, control V. Oh, does it work? There. Uh, 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 really wanted to do this address. Ah, okay, got it. So I need to just speak like this. It should be there, not found. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so what I wanted to show is that uh, you can really like find uh, the implementation of, of printf and you can evaluate its size. But the problem here is that you have to really take recursive dependencies to kind of to see that, you know, this high level printf function calls low, low level formatting functions and stuff like that. But uh, that's doable, right? Okay, so static disappeared, right? So that's the answer, answer to the question. There was another question. So uh, is there Is there a difference between how we use them? Uh, no, like uh, the high level processes as, as, as always, you take a bunch of input files, let's say in C, right, dot C, you compile them and then you say, well, the final product of this link me as either a shared library and then it will be used with this AR tool, which is essentially like an archive in a dynamic library will be just linked into elf execu executable. And the compiler will put enough information into those symbol tables uh, to make sure that this library can be loaded dynamically and linked against the program. And I, I wanted to make this uh, a drawing in a second, so which illustrates that, and I will. So just hold on for a sec. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to see the difference between whether you will use the PIC or not. The second one is uh, when, when we do the dynamic uh, library, uh, like uh, when, uh, when during the runtime, when we call some function inside a dynamic library, will, will that load the whole dynamic library or just part of the dynamic library? Right, so two questions. So we will. I will try to regenerate the code without position independent code in a second. Uh, I need to look up the flag. I thought that no PIC does it, but any, and it did in the past, but maybe the compiler changed. Mm -hmm. And the second question was uh, whether when we when we load the, a dynamic library, whether we load the old dynamic library in memory or we somehow can optimize and take only the functions which we need. So what do you think? Uh, probably just uh, load the, the, the use the function. Well, that, that would be nice, but it's not done for a couple of reasons. Uh, reason number one, it uh, would increase the linking complexity because at, at this point when you, uh, I mean, you can, you can do anything, right? So in, technically speaking, but typically uh, it would uh, require you to somehow analyze the binary and say, okay, I I'm only using those functions, right? Yeah. And extract them. You theoretically can do that by saying, okay, maybe I'm gonna do that lazily and going through some tables. And when I hit an entry in that table and say, and I say, okay, look, uh, I will load this function and that's doable. And it's it's roughly how this PLT works. So instead of like uh, lazily loading something from disk, they simply load everything from disk in memory because it's just much simpler. It simplifies the linking and loading process. And then, however, resolving addresses 
are is done lazily because because there is like a ton of uh, addresses and it doesn't make sense to resolve them upfront. So essentially, when you call a printf, the very first time you call a printf, you land on a specific table which is called PLT procedure linking table, and the linker actually finds the in instance of a printf inside the library which you loaded and puts the pointer to the printf in the table. And, and then you execute the printf. But the next time you call printf, you just directly jump to the printf in memory. So this is called lazy, lazy linking. Just because you might, out of the thousands of functions, maybe you call like only 10%, right? And so linking is done lazily, but loading, they load everything in memory. But the main problem that it's often, it's not always decidable uh, which functions will be used in the program, right? So because uh, it, it requires certain analysis, like you, you have to statically analyze that only those functions will be called. It's hard. So, oh, and it's not always correct. So like, here actually, uh, we don't save the loading, we save the linking, yeah, as you described. We save the linking memory, but uh, the load that we will, Anyway, load the right. We we'll, we're gonna load the entire the entire library. I see. Thank there you. is this step which compiler is doing, which tries to, as I was saying, those uh, link time optimizations. I hope you all. They're pretty powerful. So then, uh, again, probably a topic for a compiler class. So if if any of you is in a compiler class, so ask ask the person who teaches it how it's done and why and what are the trade offs. Otherwise, we'll spend like a lot of time. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? All good. I just wanted to show you one other thing. So uh, I compiled with no optimizations, right? A static or dynamic, uh, or even like just say, just say minus C just to compile, right? So if we compile and I'll do object dump on this. Uh, mm -hmm. Where's my object dump? On this file, we have this function, which which is exactly as I was saying, uh, like in class, right? So, uh, what do you think will happen if I even try to optimize a little, like put minus o here? It says minus o means use level zero optimization on the code. What if I compile? What will we see here? Right, it's not just stack, but it will push it into EX register. Let's see. I agree with you. At O1, it still does something, right? No, at O0. So it still does this almost the same, right? So just a little bit optimized uh, management of registers, all right? So for example, uh, what it does here is uh, blah, blah, blah. So this D is actually eleven, right? Do you agree with this? Eleven? Or I'm wrong? B is eleven? Yes, eleven. Uh I always let's check with Python. Eleven. No, XB eleven. Gosh. So it computed eleven. The reason it didn't like uh, it does push eleven in the stack, as you say, because it wants to call print app, right? So if you would just simply return it, uh it would just be just pushing uh, 11, and it does here in the EX, right? So it's exactly what it did at, at uh, you'll see a difference. What's the... what's the difference? Like it doesn't compute, there is no addition anymore, right? So it just says, okay, I statically at compile time computed that five plus oh. six is 11. So it's the I optimization see. is called, I think, constant propagation and compilers, right? Oh. Uh, it still pushes it on the stack because it has to call print half here. Mm -hmm. and since we're returning this value, it simply says, okay, I will push, I will move 11 into EAX and return, right? So, I mean, and uh, like, just don't get surprised. So you will see some of these optimizations, right? So sometimes they're kind of extreme, but like typically they're not as bad. So you, you still can like, in, in case of C and, and language like Rust, you can still, so there is not not much to optimize anymore. 
right? So you will you will you will be able to read assembly. But I just wanted to make sure that compiler can do those tricks for you. Like for example, when you build a hash table, if it's a power of two, if can, if it can propagate the, the constant instead of like modular operation, right? Which is division, it will actually do a shift for you, for example, which is a big deal. And sometimes it doesn't, and then you kind of screwed because division suddenly takes like 15 cycles and suddenly you have, I mean, depending on how well you build your hash table, you feel those 15 cycles and you think, okay, man, like really, this is like really power of two and you still, still really do division. So sometimes, I mean, I've seen those cases where I have to go into the assembly and check that it doesn't do division accidentally just because it cannot understand that through some templates, it cannot propagate that it's really a power of two. Any questions? Okay, so good. So you wanted to see, uh, I forgot what I have to put here. I would say may, maybe F, no, e, P, A, E. What is, no, what is that? Uh, no flag. Um, let me quickly look for it. So I am I hope I can find. Uh, GCC, do not. Uh, I hope that should work. F pick. There. And no PIC. What does I do? That's what I do. Uh, maybe. So did I misspell the flag? It should work. Uh, no, actually, okay, so this one looks like uh, uh, Yeah, no, this is still parts of position independent code. And if I call if I search for main, Who does this for me? And if I probably if I link statically, then maybe uh, let's try it again. Yeah. So in this specific example, look when I link statically, uh, it will just produce a regular, uh, like regular address. So it's essentially remember, like I was saying, it's a uh, it goes to to this address, which is which is encoded as a relative value, relative location, right? Couple of zeros and then sixty two eighty one. So it's just a jump forward, right? So why it refuses to produce? Ah, uh, if I don't say link statically, and if I, for example, remove PAC here and just say static, that might still produce a position dependent code, but maybe not. Uh, yeah, so static linking forces it to avoid PAC. So don't know the answer. So you have to take it offline and, and dig it up for you. Or you can like search why it's work. Why why does it work this way? But we kind of got the idea that okay, uh, if you if you uh, really want to avoid position in independent code, you can link statically. Like that's what we that's what X plus six will do. And uh, well. Well, generate the code which we roughly cover in class. So again, no optimizations here. So it's uh, like straightforward assembly. Okay, good. Enough examples. Good because we learned everything what we needed to learn from them and got bored. But uh, back to back to back to the position independent code. Okay. So remember, like, let me just make a make a picture for you. So essentially. You have your, sorry, you have your, uh, you have your main function. It sits on disk and you hand, have your libc. It also sits on disk, right? When you load main in, in an address space of a program, the operating system will load the main 
with text and data section and load the libc, right? And the next time someone else, like maybe you start WC, essentially WC will be a different process. Again, someone will load WC and it will essentially share the memory of libc into that address space, right? So we achieve sharing on disk and in memory, right? And that's the whole point of the shared libraries, right? So then you save a lot of space, both on disk and in memory, right? And uh, like, remember the problem. So the real problem is that you say, look, maybe this libc library will end up at a different address uh, in different address spaces, right? In different in different processes, right? And the goal is to make sure that the code section is really can be mapped read only. So like, and it's the same code section, meaning that it cannot use a single absolute address because if it has an absolute address, but it's mapped on a different in a different uh, address in a specific address space, then you kind of screwed, right? So it doesn't work this way. And the whole idea is how to generate the code in such a manner that it doesn't have this absolute addresses, right? And uh, again, this uh, this brief part is based on this blog post by uh, Ellie, um, and it's it's a very nice read. So like, click this link, uh, read it fully. But I will explain part of it, right? So the main idea which we're trying to build is to generate code in such a way that it works no matter where it's located in the outer space, right? So again, if I remind you what needs to be changed in this, in the text section or the code section of the program, right? So if you have a relative jump, which says like plus five or minus two, right? Or a call plus five, they are relative. That's not a problem to us, right? So that's fine. It can be mapped anywhere. Stack data is relative to the stack again. So it's like EBP, ESP plus something, right? What we need to take care of are global variables and functions imported from other libraries because we don't, don't even know where those libraries will be loaded, right? They can be anywhere in the address space, right? So if we have an address, we don't know it yet, right? So, so we have, somehow have to deal with them. And so, again, remember, I asked you this question. So how can you build position-independent code? And uh, remember, we came up with this idea that if your code section text is always at the same distance relative to your data section, right? So like if you're saying, okay, look, I'm trying to read a variable from here, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah, beauty. If you're trying to read a variable from here, If you say that I know this distance, if I can compute my current location in memory, which is pointed by EAP, and then use this distance, let's say delta, then the address I'm trying to access is EAP plus delta, right? So that's the main kind of idea. Okay, let's take a look at the details. So at a high level, what they're doing, they introduce a table, which is this additional layer of indirection to access all references. And the distance to that table is known to the compiler and Lincoln linker upfront. So like this distance remains constant, even if the code is relocated or mapped, like moved in the address space to a different address. Uh, at a high level, it looks like this, right? So you have your text section, that's the same, the same figure, which I was just drawing, but uh, drawn more formally. You say, I'm trying to move something from the data section into a register, for example. And you say, well, I have this distance, which is an offset, EF80, right? And the distance is always the same, like meaning that if I change the upper bits of these addresses, those access to something, right? So I'm moving the binary up or down in the address space, this address 80 and this address will be the same, right? Because if, if you add this, Eight zero plus this offset, you will end up here, right? So roughly, like you, you see how it works. So at the level of addresses, right? And what you can do is you say, look, I will really 
uh, put a table here, right? And uh, the table will be called a global offset table, GOT. And it will contain the addresses of variables in my data section, right? So, and uh, the reason is that uh, it can happen that this variable is actually coming from yet another library, right? Which means that you really say, like, you, you, would, you, you can ask a question, why do we really need this table? Why not to just directly read from the data section, right? Because we already have an offset, right? But uh, the problem is that, uh, you know, like if this variable is not yours, but coming from a different library, then you really don't know upfront where it will be and the distance will be different. But if you say, look, I, I have a placeholder for this variable, let's say A, I will always, it's in my table, I will always find this A, I will always find the address of A, and even if it's somewhere else, I will find it, right? But the table will always be there for, for each variable, right? So kind of a trick. and. Uh, Okay, cool. This, since GOT is in your data section, it's private to you, right? So you might link uh, with uh, like, like the positions of those variables might be unique to you, right? So, but like you can, those are like, you have memory to fill them in, right? And each process will have its own GOT, right? So now, I will ask you a question, which is a little bit unusual. Like, uh, is there a way to to figure out this mass? So, meaning that, like, imagine you doing this move instruction, right? And you're saying, okay, I really want to access, uh, like, a, a place in the GOT. I know the distance to GOT. It's some delta, right? But in order to put an address here, like I get it, I will put this plus delta, but I need something here as well, like some kind of a register which shows me like my current location here, right? In the program. So do we have an instruction for this? Load effective address. LEA says, well, you can put EAX inside EA, like any general register, but it doesn't take EAP because it's not a general register. Right, so exactly. So that's what I was trying to hint. So look, load effective address or any of those move instructions don't take EAP as an argument on a 32-bit instruction set. 64-bit uh, instruction set actually fixed that problem, but let's just see how, how you can solve it. So you say, look, I really, know the, I really need to know the value of EAP. And the way to solve it is to use the call instruction because the call instruction will push the EAP plus the size of the current instruction on the stack, right? And uh, you can really like use this trampoline to say, look, I will call the label, which let's say, I mean, you can organize it differently, but let's say a label which immediately follows this instruction, right? And of course, since the call lands you here, but pushes the this address EAP on a stack, you can restore it in the EBX register, right? So this is the trick for how to learn the EAP, right? Go ahead. And can you guys use that you cannot on x86, uh, on a 32 bit version of x86. And they started doing this trick. And that's why when Intel moved to 64 bit instructions, they introduced the relative to EAP addressing. So they allow tricks to like avoid this, right? But okay, but this is kind of a cute, like, like ele elegant trick, right? So you, you learn the EAP. Now you know the distance, right? So this is this EAP plus delta, which I was talking about, right? and you can access your global offset table, right? Agree with this? Right. Okay, so just to show you the example of how a compiler generates this code, it generates it slightly differently, right? But it's, it's, it's again, it's very simple, so let's just go through it. And then when you 
start debugging your stuff, you will be able to understand what's going on here. So again, a very simple program here. So it has one global variable, my globe, which is like 42 here. And you do this addition with two arguments which are passed uh, on the stack to this my global, right? Okay, cool. So like, again, compiler generates this trick with figuring out the location of the GOT, right? So you really like, you are about to access the address of my global, right? So you call this, like, and this is what we've seen in just disassembled code. You, you saw those tongue functions, right? And it says that I, I will use CX register to save intermediate value, right? So there is an instruction, there is a function here and it calls it, right? So it calls and says, okay, look, I save the return address on the stack. So I will put it back in the, ECX register here, right? Agree? And immediately return. Coming back here, right? Okay, so we learned where we are in the code, right? And save it in the ECX register. So that's very similar to what we've seen like in, in a previous slide. Then we say, look, we know this offset and this is a constant, one dB zero, right? It's the constant to this uh, global offset table. And so we add this offset to the EC, e, ECX register, right? And then we move on and say, look, now we really need to access a specific entry uh, in the global offset table. And it happens that it's like the offset is negative. So minus 16, because maybe it gave us an address of the, the offset was maybe the end of the GOT, right? And we save it in the EAX register. So now EAX contains the the actual uh, address, right? And so at this point, you say, look, uh, like we read, this is this was the address of the entry in the table, right? We loaded it, this, like it contained the address, which points somewhere in address, in memory, right? And we loaded it in EX. Now we use this address to access this location in memory and we save it in the EAX. And so EAX will actually contain the value of my global at this point, right? And at this point, it's it's easy, right? So you do regular addition because your arguments A and B are on the stack and they are EBP plus eight and EBP plus C, right? And the result still stays in the EAX. So you can leave the frame and return EAX according to the calling convention, right? So, and this is what the, the compiler will generate. So if we disassemble again my example, you will see this trick. Is it clear? Question. We want to ask this that uh, in 30 of the architecture, we don't allow to read the CIP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the 64 architecture, we can read the CIP. Correct. So, so, so why don't they don't allow the beginning and then later? <laughs> they they miss it, I think. They just simply missed the need for doing this. Uh, why did they make AAP special and like accessible only by those jump and pull instructions? I honestly don't know what was the design decision for them, but they missed the, back then PAC was not a, like a de facto standard. So people said, okay, we don't really need this feature. Static linking was believed to be sufficient. And so the micro architecture doesn't simply provide it support for it. But then, you know, people said, okay, like it's, it's a very useful thing to like share the libraries in memory, right? So let's do it and started doing this trick. And the trick is not really like super ideal, right? So let's let's discuss uh, in a second what the advantages and disadvantages are of position independent code, but, uh, but uh, it became popular, like, and so then Intel evolved and said, okay, look, we, we're going to add some support to do it just to simplify this thunking. And they essentially allow you to like use a relative address to AAP. Any other questions? Good. Okay. So again, so what did we learn? Uh, this, the trick was the table, right? Global offset table is, is put in the in the data section. So it's private to each process, right? So we essentially uh, uh, 
save some linking time as well here because we say, look, uh, the GAT like uh, is patch per variable, meaning that not per variable references because reference because there are multiple places in the code which reference the same uh, the same variable, right? But when you link instead of patching all the relocation entries in the program, now you just patch one entry in the GOT, right? That's kind of clever, cute. So your linking time goes down right? insignificantly, but still a little bit, right? Uh, and so we essentially save this time required to, to relocate, right? Uh, and, but if we, if we think about this position independent code and advantages of, and disadvantages, so I'll like, ask you to like, let's go to the poll thing which we have and give me your ideas as like why position independent code might be uh, a good idea and might be a bad idea at the same time. I will try to enable my polling activity. Ah, so what is good and bad about PAC? It's a free response. So I'll, I'll pull, let me actually show you this thing. We don't have any responses yet. And think about in terms, think about it in terms of performance, overhead, space, stuff like that. Easy to link, okay, that we just covered. Interrupt handling is good. Why? Bad. Two memory accesses, if not in the cache. That's a good one. Yeah. So we can share print up in memory. That's a good one. Empty good. Yeah. Wow. Well, <laughs> okay. If I ask you a question, so under what condition you might choose not to use position independent code? Like imagine it's a million dollar question for you. You're starting a business or get being hired by or interviewed by a big company. Not to use position independent code. What is the main argument against? And maybe if we're making something just don't... make it maybe for some making something really small. Like tell me how you plan to to save space and what space. If you don't plan to use ex external libraries and everything is linked like as a, as a static uh as a static executable right and you say yeah but what is that you say you don't need it but what will what, what will what will be in your way as a what is it what is the problem you're trying to address or might be trying to address like what is really bad about it anyone Right. So okay. So this is this is a sound example, and maybe it uh, like uh, kind of reflects or like comes back to what you suggested. So what you say is that look, we just saw the how the access to GOT is performed. So it, clearly, it adds some instructions, which means that if you really in some embedded systems system, and maybe you 
try to fit it in like four kilobytes, right? And uh, it's actually kind of amazing. So uh, again, anecdotes, uh, why? Ah, I already told it, so sorry. So this Roomba vacuum, which I bought in the first one, I forget when, but it had a camera, right? So it goes around my apartment or home and uh, has a camera and does this algorithm, which is called uh, uh, SLAM, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, meaning that the very first Roomba, which I had, was just random. It just was randomly moving inside my room, hits a table, goes around in a random, random fashion, eventually covers the whole room. Watching it was fun, but okay, clearly it runs out of battery quite fast. They put a camera and said, okay, we're gonna learn the room as we go. And uh, like me making it, it, it takes pictures and says, okay, I've seen this. I know that like, it, as it goes, it maps, it creates a map of a room. So it, it's way less random. So it's almost like, like I would like, I would be mopping the floor myself. I would do that, right? So they, it takes this trajectory. The amazing thing about this uh, microcontroller, which that Roomba used, it was, I would even say, either 16 or 8-bit microcontroller. It, I was impressed. I thought that they're going to send this data to the cloud, process it, and send it back. No, somehow they managed to build it and fit it on a tiny microcontroller. Like, I don't know, I didn't take a robotics class. Maybe you did, but like, seems kind of crazy to create a room like it's some kind of image recognition, stuff like that, right? So, but somehow worked for them. And in this example, when you really like building a sensor which sits on a wall, maybe harvests energy of whatever external sources, like doesn't have a battery, just has a capacitor, right? And maybe it's harvests energy from vibration or from sun. You say, look, like really I have a tiny, tiny memory. And for that example, I just like every instruction matters. So we'll over optimize my algorithm, simple, Everything will be overly optimized. So overheads of accessing GOT are excessive. And I totally agree with you. Maybe that's a bad idea, right? So take it. So embedded systems to save the code space. And as a result, maybe save memory, save energy, stuff like that, right? So good. What other, like when else would you try to avoid it? Like say data center scenario, do you care? Like those instructions, they don't only add space. What else do they add? They add overhead. They add overhead to execution, right? So if we go back and see, like we we saw, like clearly there is a function call which pushes something on a stack, which you know takes a couple of cycles because we know that to access the first level cache takes you like two cycles, then pop something from a stack, another two cycles, then add another, add a at an offset, another cycle, like, so you, you you add like maybe seven cycles, right? And if you invoke a lot of functions on a critical pass, and maybe all what you do is just invoke a function on a hash table or something, because you're counting, let's say, k mers or sequences of lengths k in a genome, and you really paid to make it as fast as possible, you say, look, well, that's too much. I don't want to do that. I, I just want to play in C code, which just like accesses the, the hash table directly. And we had some uh, answers saying that it is an extra access adds another pressure on a cache, right? And a cache, especially first level cache is not that big, right? So it has, it's a 32 kilobytes of data. If you divide it by cache lines, so 32 by kilobytes by eight, what is that like? You cannot divide that fast, 512, 512 lines. Like losing a line is, is kind of painful, right? So that's 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 a disadvantage. It's okay. Question or comment? Great. Disadvantage or advantage? And okay, if it's a disadvantage, why why security is a disadvantage? Um, okay. No, you have a point here. So there is this. Uh, there was this memes online where you build like a super secure system and somewhere at the bottom, you use some logging library from some third party component and it has a bug. And then, you know, your, all your software stacks are these vulnerable to that bug, right? And today I think it's called uh, supply chain security. So essentially validating that the software comes from a specific source and has a specific uh, kind of like a trust guarantees, I guess. But I don't think static linking against this library versus dynamic linking solves the problem, right? You still like trust this piece of software, right, somehow. So that said, 
it's it probably doesn't change the equation. You have a common. Yeah, that's just. Hold on, that's a great common. It's wrong, but it's great. So <laughs> hold on. Operating systems are not designed to allow other processes to to change anything, right? So that's important to understand. Look, like the the text is shared read on. Right? So you cannot really ch change anything in the code section of a code, right? So that has to be clear. The GOT section is private to a process, right? So one process will have its own GOT, another is another GOT, right? So in theory, they cannot affect each other, right? Do, do, do you understand that? So the isolation is preserved. You have a point saying that, okay, look, there might be some side channel attacks, meaning that... Uh, it's hard to explain, actually. Uh, so let's take it, like, again, take it offline, side channels. But what I wanted to say is that security can actually be improved because this uh, position independent code allows you to randomize the address space of the program, right? Imagine when you link statically, you say main is always at address zero. So if you crafted an exploit, you just know all the addresses up front because you know where they will be mapped. And you immediately jump somewhere and just start exploiting, right? Do whatever you want. With position independent code, it allows randomization of the address space. You place the libraries randomly in the address space, and for attacker, it's an extra space, an extra step. Attacker has to learn where the printf, for example, is, right? If it wants to jump, if they want to jump to printf, right? Agree? So that's actually that that's the real reason. There are ways to break address space randomization. So it's like kind of like a secondary measure, kind of defense in depth, meaning that it's a second line of defense, but still it's it's exploitable. You said that the code is readable. Even the attacker knows the address of the print app. What, what could they do? Ah, uh, well, let's uh, let's let's maybe like towards the end of this class, I will give a lecture on vulnerabilities and exploits. Uh, again, partially why you take this operating system class and why do we take this in-depth look into what's inside the process is to even able to understand how these attacks work, right? Because you, you, you really know what's inside. And from there, it's your creativity. And people became like very creative. Uh, a short answer will be a typical exploit either wants to... Uh, learn a piece of information like a password. So it has to, for example, first of all, figure out where this location in memory, then find something what is called the read primitive, which and a, a bug in your, of a flow in your program, which allows you to read this location in memory. And maybe if you want to send it over the network, for example, or print it on the screen, then it has to pass it to print up, right? And the question is like, can you achieve it? And uh, depending on what uh, countermeasures are deployed, it, it becomes like it's a different technique. But like yes, it's exploitable, and I will I'll, I'll tell you how. But let's bear with me for a sec. Uh, but by by hiding the address of print half, it complicates you, and hiding the address of where the because the data section is also random because if it's position independent code, the data section can be placed anywhere. So your the address of this password variable can be anywhere in the address space. So you first have to figure it out. But again, it's doable. Uh, so any other questions? Okay, so let me close the poll. Somehow, like, we have, like, everyone in class physically answered, right? At least something. Right? Good. Let me close. It's like people who are driving cars uh, should stop uh, answering. Uh, close the poll here. Uh, and what I wanted to say, uh, let's just quickly review advantages and disadvantages here. Uh, like this is what I was like, like most of which we we probably discovered as we were talking. So the code gets slower because you waste one register to essentially like in this case it was CX right CX will contain the address of GOT right so and which means that out of eight registers you and maybe you already use EBP to, to maintain the frame. 
So maybe out of six, you lost another one, you left with five. Wow, not a good idea, right? So because it will push and pop, right, uh, more frequently when you will be running out of registers. You had a question? Great question. So what do you think? And I will like it's over the track a little, but great question. So let let's do it. Right. But again, the beauty of this class is that it's kind of down to the bottom. There are gates, right? So and I I did not explain how exchange or atomic uh, operations work right now. I will talk about it a little later. But imagine you say you have an atomic swap. Uh, it's an instruction on x86, which is called exchange with the lock prefix, prefix, right? And you say, look, I will like uh, exchange two memory locations. And you say, I like, they are really in memory. So this, uh, uh, hold on, I will exchange a location in memory. So essentially it will be pointed by, let's say EX. And you say, I will put something what is contained in EBX and whatever was there will be placed back in EBX, right? So, but we are operating on this memory location, right? So in the end, your instruction will look like this. It's just the question is like, we have to figure out the value of EX first. And so what you do first, you say GOT, somewhere here, you start this thunking trick. You go into GOT, read an entry, and that will provide you an address of this value of EAX, which you later put in the exchange instruction. So in the end, it doesn't matter. You still, your atomic operation operates on, on, a, on a memory location, right? The fact that you did some additional steps to figure out the address doesn't matter. So GOT is not, is not in a way of atomic operations this way. Uh, okay, so this is clear. So, like again, code gets slower because additional memory dereferences. GOT can be large back to these embedded systems, right? Because if typically the code doesn't contain many global variables, but maybe you're unlucky and you someone gave you a library with a ton of those variables, then you have GOT just doubles the space because you're not only keeping the variables, you're also keeping their uh, references to them, right? Uh, again, this is my and yours about the hash table saying, okay, higher cache pressure because you're reading the entry in GOT. Definitely, it's a cache line, right? So that's not bad. And plus the call instruction, which adds like plus five cycles to, to resolve the, the entry, the IP address. So the good stuff is you can share the memory of most commonly used libraries like Freehab and you guys answered that and that's a big deal right so again what is the big deal hmm. like we have so much memory now unless we're running embedded systems so and we have uh, those various i mean who's a big nix user nix is a is a purely functional package manager aimed to solve all the uh dependencies uh, or the the dependency hell because you have a version of software that uses a specific version of printf and printf is a simple example, but let's assume specific version of a crypto library. And it just doesn't work with any other version, like plus one after like version one, two, three, plus 3.5, it just breaks because they, they broke the interface, right? And so Nix will essentially package everything in such a manner that specifically this version of the library will be visible in a file system to this version of your program. And if you're using Nix, then, well, you're not really sharing libraries anymore because, I mean, you do, but your frequency of sharing is going down. And it used to be in the days that we used one version of libc. Today, like, it's not just Nix. So even on Ubuntu, you have this, uh, what is it called? I forgot. Their package manager now says, okay, I will, like, bring all the dependencies just for the sake of running it without uh, smoothly, right? Uh, so that's plus minus maybe it used to be more important in the past, but this address space randomization is a, is a good argument to uh, like position independent code helps you. Right. But again, it has a certain granularity because you, you're just randomizing the base address of the entire library. The moment it becomes known, you know, all the 
func the addresses of all the functions in, in this library. So it's not like, it's not super fine grain. And so people are randomizing differently, really, if, if they really care about making it secure. Okay, so we got this. Okay, the big conclusion from this two days we spent uh, on linking and loading, right? So we kind of understand what's inside the program and how it gets built, right? So we can hopefully do this object down trick and uh, read the disassembly. And we already covered the assembly language, so we have basic understanding. But we know calling conventions. We know uh, where the variables are in the data section, on the stack, on a heap. We didn't talk about much about the heap, but we kind of have an idea, right? And we have this idea that, you know, we can move or relocate binary in memory, right? And that essentially just uh, just allows you to essentially like place it anywhere, right? And we kind of know the mechanism. So we have this idea that we, a symbol table will have uh, references to all locations in, in 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 the in the text section which use absolute addresses, and we have to we have to essentially fix that, right? Uh, okay, cool. So one step closer, still not there, not ready to boot, but we didn't even touch operating systems yet. But we are getting there. Don't worry. Any questions? Good. Means I explain everything so well. Uh, okay, so we still have 10 minutes, right? So let's not give up. I actually, my plan was to move a little faster, but still have time. Man, what is it? Ozone layers, not what we want. What I wanted to start today is uh, a different lecture, which talks about address translation. So we can at least uh, start talking about it and then figure out where we where we get. So again, so the plan is to start building the kernel. In order to start building the kernel, we obviously need to understand internals of load, what's inside this linking, loading, what's inside the program calling convention, right? We already know this, right? What we don't know is uh, the idea of how actually memory is virtualized. And I happily lost my wonderful pen. That was the complaint from the from the backup device driver. Really, complain about something. Where is my pen? Really, no pen. Uh, hold on. Wanted to have a pen. Let's see if it works. Maybe. No. And I don't even know how to reload a, a device driver on, on Mac OS. I used to know on Ubuntu. So yeah, pen is gone. Okay, we'll be we'll go without a pen. So but like what we wanna learn is how to virtualize memory. So and this is we're gonna spend probably two lectures on talking about something what is called segmentation and paging, right? So paging, everyone heard about it, like seems like an exciting topic. Segmentation, on the other hand, most of the operating system classes will just skip over it, right? And just never teach it at all. The reason for that is that segmentation was almost abandoned by Intel CPUs because it wasn't really actively used and Intel said, okay, it takes us too much time to verify the correctness of our logic of the CPU gates so just let's simplify segmentation as much as possible. However, there are two reasons to learn. First of all, in order to really build a real physical hardware, you really need to understand how to set up the segments, right? It just cannot, you cannot enable paging without enabling or enabling segmentation first, only Intel. Second, the irony of this uh, Intel's kind of destiny is that they, they drop segmentation and suddenly everyone wants it back. Believe it, like it's a multi-billion business. They, you, you drop a feature and you miss the target. It's kind of like with this relative to EAP uh, instruction point or addressing. They just miss the point that segmentation can be actually a great mechanism for providing isolation within one address space, meaning that it became so like 
kind of volatile in, in it or aggressive in this uh, uh, attack defense space that we no longer want, like typically I say, a, one process is isolated from other processes. Now we want isolation within the process, meaning that a library, which I don't trust, shall not be able to access my SSH keys or my passwords, right? Because I don't trust it. So this logging library, which we said was graphing everything or was exploitable, should, should be running in some other compartment within the same address space. And you technically can do that with page tables, but it's just too expensive. And so now everyone is working kind of backwards and saying, okay, can we bring features like segmentation back to enable efficient isolation within the address space? Which means that if you understand paging or if you understand segmentation from this class and you suddenly decide to spend uh, your career doing some security research, you will be well prepared to essentially say, okay, look, I understand how it works. I understand how VASM, which we all know uh, these days works and how it can be optimized with a segmentation, by the way. Okay, cool. So what is that I'm talking about overall, right? So the segmentation and paging, right? Back to my intro lecture, I said, okay, we have on the machine, when we want to build a operating system, we say, look, we want to run multiple programs in one memory, right? So there's a green and yellow, they run, they context operating system context switches between them, but we really have one DRAM bank. So run one physical address space, which goes from zero to some max address, right? So the question is like, uh, how can we build this? So do you guys have an idea how to implement this abstraction of like running multiple, multiple programs in one address space? There might be multiple answers here. Like again, just to, to make an, oh, I cannot make illustrations because I wasn't bad. Like one address space. Ah, no, it's impossible. Okay, so any ideas? Yeah. Getting props abstracted. Correct. So what you're saying is that I, as a software designer, forget about it. I don't want to even think about how to build it in software. I ask hard. I, I will ask for hardware support, which allows somehow remapping of addresses. So address zero in one process will map to physical address 55. And in another process, it will map to physical address 1055, right? Something like that. That's a, that's a decent approach. But if I ask you again, you're building an embedded system, you're like optimizing like crazy and the constraints are mostly power just because you're running out of power. And you say, look, page tables are too expensive in terms of logical gates. They add like another some, something number of watts of power, right? Can you do it in software? Like this idea that you can run multiple processes, multiple uh, programs in one other space. It's kind of related to what we learned over the last couple of weeks. Something with the synchronization or atomic? No, 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 no atomics, just one CPU embedded system, for example. Um, when a program yields, do you copy it to like a different location in memory and then copy the other program? That's, that's a sound answer. Like, like that can work. So what your classmate is suggesting is that forget about it. We have another memory or disk. Every time we start a program, we switch one from one program to another. We'll just copy it out completely and copy it back. That's expensive. You will get fired right away for suggesting this. Your colleagues will hate you, but uh, any other ideas? But it's an answer, right? So, but you can like, what? Okay, I'll ask you a question. What prevents you from loading and running WC and let's say grab in one address space from zero to like, let's say max address? What's wrong with that? Can you do it? I just taught you that you can relocate. You just say, okay, well, I'll link WC to run at zero. I'll link grab or like relocate grab to run at 1,000. They will be running there, right? Why not? Agree with this? Again, like that's the answer. Uh, really, if you, if you are on a very constrained system and which has no hardware support, like my whatever, my my Roomba vacuum, it, 
like no page tables on Roomba on that microcontroller. I will, I will actually bring it back. So that's the trick you can do. You say, look, I have two programs. They have program, text, data, heap, stack, and then yellow one. And I just like relocate the green one to run at zero and the yellow one to run at this 11,000, 11, 110,000 in hex, right? And that will work, right? Why not? That's the, the beauty of this linking, loading, understanding what's inside and really hate. And you don't even need position independent code. You just say, look, I, when I will load the program, I will really hate, right? Works. We can build Roomba, which runs two programs in this case, right? So you waste. Well, what do I waste? I still need, maybe I will waste a little bit here. Okay, hold on. Let's waste, we can discuss. I, I argue that we don't waste too much. Because you still, in most cases, you you will need memory to back up those everything, right? If you're accessing data and and text and everything, maybe you're only using wasting this region, which may not be used immediately, right? But later or map backed up by physical pages. But my point was that you can do this trick, right? Again, like what what is bad about it? Again, as a like as a security, yeah, go ahead. Exactly, they are not isolated, right? Back in the days, that's fine. Everyone is a good citizen, you know, on, on our one mainframe which will run an MEB. So, like you know, that person will be just physically, you know, lectured um, not to do it anymore, but. First, people do mistakes. And second, now we have a huge malware economy, which makes millions, or we most probably billions, by stealing credit cards and stuff like that, right? So it's a, it's a profitable business to attack. And here, like, maybe there is a, like, you, your Apache web server, which opens, opens a website, runs a green address page, and you open some weird web page, right? And it just accesses your yellow page, which maybe holds your security keys to or a password to, to another, like to a bank account, right? So that's not good, why? Because uh, green can, if you do it, a move instruct inside the grid process, you can easily put this address in the yellow range and nothing prevents you from accessing it, right? Okay, that's really a problem. So do you think you can solve it in software without any additional hardware support? Let me tell you how much time we have. It's the last minute of our class. So is that one of the things that we're going through space? Correct. Yeah, yeah. That's how paging and, and in fact segmentation works. It just doesn't allow you to issue an address from another program. But but imagine we're again building Roomba for whatever reason. And I will leave, leave you with this question, with the question of... Uh, whether you can solve this problem without any additional hardware support? The answer is obviously yes. The hint is uh, Google Knuckle and Wasm. So whoever wants to go read about Wasm and understand how it works, you're welcome. So Wasm specifically solves this problem by loading a trusted binary in the ever space of your web browser. So like you loading a Quake inside your web browser and the Quake still cannot access anything from the web browser. Quake is written in C, so those move instructions are there and stuff like OC++ probably. Okay, thank you here, and uh, I'll see you then uh, next week. Uh, expect the homework later today, a quiz over the weekend, stuff like that. I'm about that, yeah. I would say we allocate.